So now we want to move into, okay, the Hoosier folks said, now we've talked about power factor and motors and drives, a little bit about identifying PQ issues and problems. How many of you have a formal power quality program in place that's in writing that says who or what position is responsible for essentially taking the issue of power quality equipment operation problems to, and that is the person that's going to be responsible for figuring out what we do about this, to figure out what the problem is and what the solution might be. Okay, so if it's not formal, it's informal, who is that in your plant? I would guess many of it, yeah, you're sitting right here. That person is right here. You become, whatever reason, the de facto, the buck stops there at your desk to figure out what we're going to do about this equipment that's not working correctly. Okay? So I see a lot of companies today that are saying, okay, because what you're ending up with is, that's not my job. Well, it's not my job description. He's the one that ought to be doing that. And they're both that don't want to do it, pointing at the same person, saying, that's the logical person. Okay? And now you just got voluntold to do it. And it's not part of your job description. So the issues like that, that helps out. Everybody knows who is in charge. Who to go to. Who's the go-to person to initiate the, I think we got an issue that somebody needs to look at with power quality. So pay attention to system maintenance and grounding and equipment trip settings. I get called to a lot of power quality problems where we put recording equipment out and the power quality is perfect, but the equipment is still acting up. So now we have something else to change. And a lot of times grounding issues or equipment trip settings is what we find. Grounding, that's a well discussed and cussed subject, right, in any facility. Can I have a ground that's too good? Can my ground be so low impedance that it creates other problems? The answer is yes. If I'm the best ground in the area and somebody has a motor that short circuits to ground and it wasn't grounded right and the overcurrent device can't trip, where most likely is all that short circuit current that they're injecting into the earth coming back out of the earth to get back to their transformer? through my facility down the road because I'm such a low impedance ground. And now you've got equipment that's malfunctioning and not acting correctly and maybe people getting shocked somewhere. And you're going, where'd all this current on my neutral come from? It's flowing from the neighbors. You shut all your loads off, you kill the main fuse, the main breakers. Go to zero usage and it's still there. It's not coming from you. Somewhere else. Okay. What's every electrician's first thought when they see that problem and they see high voltage between the neutral and the earth and high current on the neutral? How am I going to get rid of that? Ground rod. Yeah, I'm going to drive another ground rod. I'm going to ground it out with a better ground and what happens in that situation if they were already the best ground in the area and now they drive another ground rod to even lower their resistance. They were expecting it to go down, connect that ground rod, it went up because I'm an even better path now for more of it to come through me. Physics happens, right? You start thinking about that. Okay, So those types of issues. Okay. When issues occur, are you going to eliminate the disturbance source or put a black box out there to filter the bad stuff out and immunize the equipment? Either can work. They typically have different cost-benefit ratios there. What's the appropriate solution? So elements of a strong power quality program. Understand the difference between power quality issues, equipment issues, and operator issues. I've had two of these calls in my career in 35 years where we couldn't find anything power quality and we didn't find the problem until I secretly installed video cameras in the facility. And then we could see when nobody was there, nobody was looking what operators were doing. 
happen. It happens. Understand identifying the disturbance is important to identify the source. If I don't know what's causing the equipment to trip off, how do I figure out what the best solution is? There is no magic black box that I can put in front of a piece of equipment and take care of every power quality issue it might see. UPS is probably the closest we come to doing that. Maintain an internal power quality or equipment operation log and use it. How many of you have a, uh, a log where if an operator has an issue or the supervisor of the operators it gets written down date, time, the equipment, and what the equipment did that wasn't correct. I see one hand. Anybody else? Do you use yours? Yeah. Every day. I've been into facilities that have them, but they don't get used. Every day. So that becomes important. Why would I want to consider that as part of my overall now physical plant maintenance? operations plan standard operating procedure. What if it's from the utility? How do you know? You have to sit down with your key account folks or co-op folks and say, well, here's the dates and events that we've had in our facility. Do they match up with anything happening on your system? And guess what? In a lot of cases, yeah. Date and the time's within a minute. Because everybody has the same time on their phones probably now today. Compared to when we used to look at the clock and it might be 10 minutes off between the utility clock and my clock in my facility. Okay. It's a great source of information to start looking and say, what was going on in our facility at the time? What was going on on the power supplier's facility? And was this something from our facility or was this something that we can't control outside our facility? That type of thing. So take that into account. Think about that. Take power quality into account when adding and purchasing new equipment. How dirty or clean is your system right now? What disturbances are already there? And how sensitive is the new equipment you want to buy? I'm seeing a lot of companies that have been through so many problems by going out and buying new control equipment, bringing it in, and it will not work correctly because they already have some dirty power in their process and the new equipment was so sensitive it wouldn't operate from day one without putting filters or other things into their system. So now I'm seeing companies that send a power quality spec to purchasing and if a company can't meet that power quality spec with the power supply in their device they have to bid the price of their equipment with a UPS or something else in front of it. So companies have finally said I'm drawing the line in the sand and if you can't meet this voltage sag for this time we're not buying your equipment. Because we're not going to put that sensitive junk in our, our plant. Okay, Or if you want us to buy it Give us the price with the UPS in front of it and we'll compare that to the other better equipment that doesn't need a UPS and which one do you think we're going to buy. Okay, so the market is sending the message back to those manufacturers. Don't make such sensitive junk that won't operate in the real world with voltage sags and swells and things like that. Okay. Considerations for adding monitoring equipment to sensitive equipment if the cost-benefit ratio can be justified. Do anybody, anybody in the room have permanent mounted power quality recorders on any mission critical equipment in the facility? We had one company yesterday in Montgomery. They've had such a problem with that piece of equipment, it's so mission critical, they want to know when it acts up, what exactly was the voltage and current going to that piece of equipment at the instant it act up. Was it something else or was it power quality? If you don't have equipment to measure and that equipment acts up, you don't have any definitive data to say yes or no. Power quality is something else. So as the price on some of this equipment has come down, some companies are doing that. I see them 
We had one in Montgomery yesterday that decided some of that mission critical equipment, they sprung for that permanent mounted equipment at that piece of equipment because they were just having too many issues. Getting in trouble too much for management about why. So this is an example of what a problem equipment operation log or power quality log could look like. Many people have their own. Some steal them off the internet from other companies. It doesn't matter. You know, you want something to provide you information. Then you can correlate with the power supplier operations and events. Correlate with internal operations. Show trends related to time of day, plan operations, line operations. By writing all those things, those malfunctions down, you get to see if there's patterns there that you recognize because you know your facility better than most. And can put two and two together to say, oh, we only get that problem when X, Y, and Z are happening. Whether X, Y, and Z are equipment running simultaneously or certain operators on certain shifts. You know, that type of thing. So it's a great place to start looking. And here's the, the reason I like it. I show up and they're telling me that the problem that they had last week happened Tuesday morning about 10 a.m. Right, Bob? No, I don't think so. I was thinking it was Wednesday about noon. Okay. Well, how do you know it was about noon? I think it was Tuesday. You're saying it's about noon. Because I was on lunch break, and I take lunch break at 11.30. You see, could you imagine that happening at your facility when you talk to operators? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Here, at least, somebody wrote it down, and we probably have something to go back to. As long as they wrote it down correctly, it's probably better in terms of what time date did that happen. As opposed to, I think it was this. No, I'm pretty sure you're wrong. I was thinking it was this. And now I'm thinking, maybe neither one of them is correct. It's from the outside. So, let me mention this. Correlate it with the utility operations or not. Neighbors operations, sometimes. That's useful. I know at 8 o'clock, if that equipment trips off, that means that the plant down the road, at 8 o'clock on certain days, they start this. Is that one of those days they started this? I can look at that. Okay, Start correlating that. Internal operations. Time of day or shift. Weather environment. I had one with a company that was doing, uh, taking natural gas off the pipeline and liquefying it. The refrigeration compressors would go down. We measured and measured and measured and looked and tested. Pretty soon, it's only in the morning when the humidity goes above 85%. And once we started figuring that out, we started looking in the box that had somebody in the panel inside on one of those mornings. Drip. Drip. Okay. That's what that log does for you. Determining monitoring is required. Okay. So after performing the inspection, is it a case where you're trying to rule power quality in or out? Or are you pretty sure it's power quality and this is a piece of equipment that's being impacted? Do you want to try to get before and after recordings if a change is proposed to be made? So you can say, this is what it was before we did this, this is what it looks like after we did this. Did we do what we thought we were going to do by changing the equipment? Are you interested in verifying modifications that have been implemented fix the situation? Those are reasons you might decide to record or monitor then power quality, either at your overall plant or a piece of equipment that's been problematic. So do we need internal monitoring? Typically done by the customer or the consultant. As the price of some of these devices has come way down in the last decade, I see a lot more companies owning their own equipment and doing it themselves, rather than bringing in the consultants that own the equipment to put it in. 
and do those things. So these typically measure and record the power quality disturbance at a strategic location in the facility. Could be sub-panels, operating lines, a problematic piece of equipment. We typically, and we'll see a slide on this, would like to get, if it's one piece of equipment that's a problem, as close to that piece of equipment as we can to see what it's seeing electrical wise. If it's the whole plant, we might start out at the meter or the main service to see what's coming in from the utility that could affect the whole plant. If it's only my new LED lights that I put in four months ago that we're losing 10 a week, maybe I'm putting that on the lighting sub-panel to see what all the lights are seeing because we're not having issues with anything else in the facility. Okay? That's the idea in terms of, okay, do we need and what are we going to monitor? Equipment today can be portable or permanently installed. Portable, I can put it out there, leave it for a while, pick it back up, take it back, it's out of the way. Permanently installed, I'm going to make the investment to put something here and now if there's a problem, we have the data to look at electrically to see what happened when that problem occurred. Was it power quality? Was the power quality good? Now I'm looking for something else. So handheld meters are still okay for facility work. Everybody has handheld volt and amp meters. The newer power quality meters that are handheld, prices come down, I see lots more of those, and some harmonic distortion meters. So I'm seeing more and more of those in maintenance, physical plant toolboxes all the time. The more electronic equipment we put in facilities and VFDs, etc. Allows us a quick check of conditions right now at that panel, at that piece of equipment to see what's, what we're measuring. Portable power quality recorders measure all kinds of different power quality things. Today those can be wired or wireless. Now with wired, typically, I wired it into a panel and then I had to go out there and download the information data onto a computer or flash drive to take it back to my office to make the graphs and everything else. Today a lot of those companies allow wireless so it will stream from that device you wire into your panel wirelessly to your computer, real time. You just go to the computer, sit down, I don't have to go out there to that part of the plant and download the data and I can see right now, or I can pull up what it's already streamed to me, what we've measured so far. And so technology is coming into that arena as well easily move from location to location around the facility as needed. Permanent, same things as these. Now I'm going to put those permanently on critical mission equipment, mission critical equipment to say when it goes, does something wrong I can see what it is. So those handheld meters are useful for lots of different things. Handheld power quality meters now. So instead of I can remember when I used to have to have a dolly cart, a four-wheel cart, to move my power quality recorder into a room. These do way more than that one did, and I can essentially carry it in my hand. Different manufacturers there, in terms of what they make. So, lots of these can record information for short periods as a handheld. So many of these will probably be able to record what you're measuring when you're in that panel for 15 minutes. Some of the other ones might go a week with their ability to record and store the information. Some have oscilloscope type displays that you can look as an oscilloscope to see what your sine waves look like and how messed up they are. So that's a category of equipment that I'm seeing more and more out there. And a lot of these you can pick up for 1500 bucks today. Where it used to cost the equivalent of $10,000 to $12,000 to get a big one then that does the same thing. This is a handheld harmonic distortion meter. 
So if I was interested in harmonics, I look in here, I measure this, it's handheld, I put it in the panel, and it tells me what frequencies I have in my signal and their magnitudes. It also gives me percent harmonic distortion. This meter, I've seen equivalents of it, not that name brand, but others, for 300 bucks out there. Power quality monitors and analyzers. Now these tend to do a lot more and record for a long time. I set them out there, I go back a week later, I pick it up, I download the data, and I look and see what my data looked like. I can buy a package unit like that that comes with the CTs and PTs for a panel for about 4,500 bucks today. And this is the type of output we would get. Three channels, three phases, if I'm just interested in three phases. Many of them have a fourth channel for the neutral if I want to see what the neutral looks like, what's going on there. Notice here, minimum, average, and maximum voltage. That graph was on a one minute basis. So we're essentially plotting the maximum, average, and minimum, minimum voltage every minute to see what's going on there. Okay? And so now I can see I've got some swells and some sags. In this particular instance, pretty much any time we went above 140, the equipment was tripping off. An electronic controller. Okay? We knew a 140 was its trip point from its specs, talking to the manufacturer. So we put the recorder on, do we have conditions where it's going above 140? Yeah, we do. What's causing those? Okay. In this case, that was a capacitor that was energized before a motor starter was hit. You see, sometimes after the voltage went up, then we get a pretty big voltage drop. That was the motor starting. That was their reduced voltage starter. We energize a capacitor, then a timer kicks in, turns the motor starter on. The voltage goes up because of the capacitor, then the inrush current hits, the voltage goes down, and then it comes back somewhere in the middle. So this is a harmonic distortion graph instead of voltage. And now anything here above 5% is a potential problem. And notice the green line, the average volt sitting down here, is running 5-ish. Except what did the green line do right there? for that period of time, during that Sunday, then Monday probably. We were up with above 60%. And then it was pretty steady there and it went back down. So now I'm looking for something that produces harmonic distortion that ran during that time. I'm chasing that down. Asking questions. What was running during that time? What was on during that time? Because we can see we've got a situation where down here, most of the time it's okay, but we had that one period where it went up high. What ran there that didn't ran anywhere else? That's what the recorders give you the ability to look at and analyze. We looked at that essentially then just the even harmonics. If you have even harmonics in a three-phase system, that means you have an arcing fault somewhere. Because what did I say about even harmonics before? They will cancel each other out. Unless you have an arc somewhere in your system. Bad connection, fault, something like that. When they looked and said what runs at that time, they knew exactly what it was. They went and looked at that equipment and they had a motor with a shorted rotor bar. And when they replaced that motor, they no longer had any problems like that. So that's what the, having the data starts to allow you to do. Look at those. Okay, show of hands. At my facility, we can measure basic voltage, current, and power factor. Okay. B, power quality disturbances, but not record them. C, power quality disturbances and record them. We have the capability equipment to put out there. D, we place permanent power quality disturbance recorders on all mission critical equipment. We had a company yesterday that does that now. They've had so many problems. 
or E, none of the above. Okay. It's always interesting to see different places I go. The companies that are doing the more expensive things are the ones that have been through bigger problems in the past. And management said, that better not happen again. You know what happens when management says, that better not happen again. We have a way to justify some more equipment and say, management said, we admit it can't happen again, so I need to buy some equipment. Where to monitor? I said as close to the panel as we can, the problem equipment. What to monitor? To figure out if you've got a power disturbance, you just need voltage. To figure out what caused the power disturbance or the voltage disturbance, you also need to measure current. That tells you what the equipment is doing in terms of what you're thinking about. 